Walking into Hoax Auctioneers, you never know what you're gonna see. And this auction, March 2024 main sale, is one of the best I've seen in years. I couldn't not open with the gun in this case. This is a Lancaster full barreled gun. Built in 1885, this thing is valued at 12 to 16,000 pounds. And there is all sorts about it that I absolutely love. We should mention this is a 28 inch, four barrel, 20 ball that weighs seven pounds, seven ounces. That's less than most modern over and unders. That's absolutely wild. This is lot 1556. That's a snap action four end and that closes up or locks up, swings off a bottom hinge, which does leave the action fairly deep. And yet, because of the width of the four barrels, it is um, really quite nice in proportion. Before we put it together, you can see inside here, you have little cutaways in the bottom of the action, and it's evident that this gun was, well, they worked hard to keep it lightweight. So on a rotary underlever, we close that up, and that clicks into place. The forend then snaps on. and away you go. It's full of interesting things other than it's four barrel, but for me, the most interesting thing is this trigger unit. It's a sort of double action rotary hammer. You cock it with the back trigger, and that brings the hammer to full cock, pull the front trigger, bang, cock, bang, cock, bang. I expect with a little bit of effort, you could get pretty good with that. I've been obsessed with four barrel guns ever since, you know, I got into guns. The concept of anything more than two barrels is kind of exciting, right? It is a non-ejector. I think making a four-barreled ejector is a step too far for 1885. This is a period in gun making where, you know, we hadn't settled down. And Charles Lancaster was, well, there's a couple of his guns in this auction. They're all just different to the sort of things you see today. It's a fairly plain action. You have light border engraving, a little bit of engraving on the screw pins there, and lovely beading around the fences. This is not an overly embellished gun which is kind of interesting. As I've said, it's two and a half inch black powder only, so this is a shootable gun, but you're just gonna need to find the appropriate cartridges. I'd love to shoot a gun like this one day, for sure. The dimensions on it is uh, it's a 14 and an eighth inch stock, which is fairly small, but it's not super flat, like you could definitely shoot. It's got a little height in the comb. Whether this is the sort of gun that you'd buy and shoot, well, it's, that's down to you. But what an experience that would be to bring this back to life, well, best part of 150 years after it was made. The checkering is big and coarse and practical, which does dictate that this gun was designed to be used. You have a swamped rib with the maker's name, Charles Lancaster, 151 New Bond Street, London. I just, I love it. It really doesn't bear more explanation that it's got four barrels and a single trigger and you can make four bangs. The gun making involved here, the engineering involved and the ingenuity involved just set me on fire. Not more than anything in this auction. This auction is one of the best Holtz auctions I've been to in a long time. But come on, it's a four barreled shotgun. Now that we've looked at a four barrel shotgun, let's look at some ones with two barrels that are perhaps a little more intelligent or certainly a little bit more desirable and accepted in the modern culture of guns. And we might as well start with something that's totally affordable for most people. There's a 682 Gold in the sale, lot 1602, in really good order. This is one of the most legendary over and of all time. Next to it, there's a Longthorn, Heskith. That's five to seven grand, a really good value Longthorn if you wanted a Longthorn side lock. Next to it, an SO9, 1687. This is a 1989 gun at seven to nine thousand pound. That's a very good value for an SO9. It does have 
a little bit of cracking in the wrist there, but it's not integral, I think it's just a grain opening up where they might have put some filler in or some such. A nice gun for the money for sure, there was a tiny crack in the top there. That's probably why it's really, really affordable for an SO9. Isn't that just a lovely thing? I spend a fair amount of time on the Holtz website, bouncing links around to my friends, as I've said in the past, because, well, you never know what's going to come up, and you'll see some of the wildest guns in the world, as I think this auction will show you. I always click on over and unders first. They're more my thing, bluntly. And this one was one of the first guns to be catalogued. This is a Beretta SL3 Mirror Polished Special Edition. <laughs> I remember an EWA 2019 when we went on to the Beretta booth and they launched this gun and Ant was, well, he fell in love with it. It took me a little longer to be convinced and, uh, well, I, I guess the thing is, it's a very marmite gun. You have to appreciate the level of work that's put in just to sit mirror polishing one of these. And I believe brand new back then, they were about 24,000 pounds. Lot 1689 is a 2019 SL3 EEL mirror polished. It's in for eight to 12,000, which is, well, less than half price of a brand new one. It has shot almost nothing. This thing is almost, it is brand new to all intents and purposes in the action. I doubt that it's shot more than 250 cartridges, which, well, for an SL series gun is barely getting warmed up. It's not a detachable trigger gun, although detachable trigger ones are available, obviously, in other SL3s. This is the fixed trigger model, which leaves it a little slimmer underneath there. The whole thing is mirror polished, and you can see yourself in the action. You could admire yourself and observe yourself for hours, which is... Well, maybe more appealing to some than others. I just love how brazen it is and how different it is and the level of craftsmanship and work that gets it to this level. The SL3 is a gun made in Beretta Due, so it is a, a premium gun, a PB selection gun. Meaning, well, it's as handmade as most everything else. The SLs do have some machine make, made parts that they have monoblock barrels versus chop long barrels. But this gun is very much a usable gun. It's a 32 inch gun weighing eight pounds eight. Either a very heavy high bird gun. And I say that in the hand, it feels quite nice. It's not, it's not bad, but it doesn't have a palm swell, which obviously puts it into the game series. If you wanted to think about it that way, the stock is beautiful, just under 15 inches and lovely, lovely figuring on that walnut. The finish is a little tired. It's definitely been a bit of a cabinet queen for the last five years. Could do with a little polish up. And the action does have a few scratches on there. But again, I don't know what it would cost to send this back to the maker or just to have it brought back to brand new. Hell, you could go off and have it custom engraved. I just, I'm fascinated by this particular model. And every time I see it, it brings me kind of, some kind of weird low grade joy. Whether that's looking at myself or just the fact that it's a mirror polished gun, I do not know. But the SL series is a hell of an action. So it's a good gun as well, which is kind of important, right? You have a solid mid rib, a ventilated top rib, and I love the venting on here. It's sort of set halfway rather than being connected by bridges. It has all the appeal to me of a solid top rib. Hand filed top rib as well, hand checkered. And it's a multi-choke, it is a multi-choke. Comes cased in the original case with chokes. It will divide opinion, I'd love to know yours. It is a novelty to look at yourself in a gun. Not that I'm looking at myself, but the reflection, you can see the guns behind me. I can see the guns behind me. It's fun, it's definitely a fun gun, a statement gun. And hey, you ain't gonna see too many. In this cabinet here are three of the finest engraved guns you will likely ever see. And they are all very different and from very different eras. This is the first one. This is from 1897. It's a W&C Scott Imperial. You usually think 1897 kind of boring guns. This pushes the boat out. It has complete oak leaf covering. You've got ducks or geese on the bottom, partridge on the right lock plate. Again, completely engraved in deep, dark background relief oak leaves. On top of that, again, you have fleur-de-lis style checkering, which is pretty out there for London guns of the time. To top that off, the other side, you have a pigeon, a woodcock, and a snipe 
it's just beautiful. You've got carved breech ends with oak leaves with sort of an intertwined vine thing, in behind which are side clipped fences with a treble grip that are deep carved in, I guess, stylized acanthus. It's stunning. If you come underneath here, those beaded edges with that dark stipple background again, you see with some deep carving that matches the top, it's just a great looking gun. 15 and a half inch stock, pistol grip, and at the back of the stock is probably my favorite thing on the gun, a skeletal buck plate with matching engraving. You have those fleur de -lis again shown in the checkering, but much smaller with a nice even border. This is fine ass gun making, and it's five to 7,000. The barrels measure well enough, but the checkering has been refreshed, and that is maybe that there's a suspected plug in there. Not that it would matter because a repaired stock is, from a practical perspective, is just as good as a new one. Unengraved shield, WC's got tower markings on the metalwork. It's unequivocally, I've used that word five times. It's straight fire. It's straight fire, Michael. WNC Scott isn't a name that most people will sort of associate with something quite this proper, but oh, what a gun, five to seven. It's easy to get distracted by Purdy's Hollands and Bosses. That deserves attention. A proper shootable modern gun, pistol grip, raised filed rib, with some engraving you could be proud of. I spoke about that for far too long because I'm now gonna rush through this next one. A 1970 Ken Hunt engraved Purdy. with gold California quail inlaid into a case color hardened action with gold pheasants and oak leaves on the other side. This is a beautiful gun. Next to the other it is a, a different gravy. I love a bit of gold and the work on these birds is absolutely stunning. The fact it's on a 20 bore side by side purdy is pretty special. It gets even better that this stock is 15 and a quarter inches. So it's actually getting on man size. That's a lovely thing. This is 18 to 22, a slightly different gravy. That's 18 to 22,000, not 1551. It's a different price point, but it's a different kind of gun. The last one of the trio is this, a James Purdy Sidelock 20 bore again from 1989 that is completely engraved by Phil Coggan, who is a fantastic engraver. You have a brace of ducks flying through the woods and the depth that you have here is really cool. You have the main subject of the ducks, beautifully done in Berlin. It looks like a pencil sketch. You have these leaves coming in at the back at a similar level. You have a dark tree that almost looks like the foreground. And in the back you have lightly done woods. It just, it looks like a, it looks like a pencil sketch, but it's cut into metal. It's so beautiful. Then the ducks are anatomically perfect, which counts for even more. Because that's not enough, you have deep carved vine and grape fences. And you have this large leaf acanthus pattern everywhere else. You have a rose on the trigger guard, which I think is stunning. I love the way that it is shaded in. And then you have this double a circle and an oval just to frame it. I just think that's so nice. But this woodcock on the bottom is unreal to the point that it has one feather out of place. That's, that's attention to detail that you just don't really get anywhere else. This is art, pure art, but it is 20 to 30,000 pounds. And so you would expect something quite nice for a 40 year old gun in that ballpark. 40, 1989, 34. 40 years old. It's really important, those, that kind of denomination, certainly yeah. around that era of birth. French partridge on the other lock. This is a beautiful, beautiful gun. And again, something that's actually kind of usable and practical. If you think what this gun would be new, well, it doesn't really bear too much thinking about what that would cost to have created now. But for 20 or 30,000 pounds, it's, that's a dream gun. Outside of private gun collections, it's rare to get anything that is this special and 
this spread across time in one place it's kind of why i love holtz and again why i spend so long on the website you just never know what you're going to see the rarest of the rare and the most beautiful of the most beautiful seem to end up coming through this room all right let's move to more affordable things Straight up, this is my favorite gun of the sale. There is literally no doubt in my mind about that. It's weird, it's interesting, it's got a great backstory, and it's super affordable, and I would be buying it, but the chance of me winning it are minimal, so I'm gonna share it with you today, so if I don't win it, I can watch this back and enjoy. This is 1597, a Larson and Winters repeating rifle of 1883, or it's an 1883 patent this gun was actually made in 1884 7 to 900 pounds is where it sits and it is a 16 gauge lever action repeating shotgun that is beautifully made feels great and is unbelievably shootable in my head let's have a look We'll start at the back because that is the way it is done. You have a metal checkered heel plate, curved, hand finished with that little tip that rises into the gun there. It's a very nice thing. The wood is plainer than plain with an oil finish and it features a pistol grip with a horn cap. The action is pretty wild. It's a lever action with a straight spring driven striker. The lever action brings the bolt back and exposes the feed tube on the bottom there. The lever itself has a split part for the trigger and the trigger comes out with it so you can keep your hand ready to go. It is so slick and so smooth to operate. You have an exposed cocking piece there and when you fire it, that goes in forward. The fore end is fairly unexotic, but you can see the mag tube in there and actually the way the wood is clamshelled onto it with that horn tip, this is fine gun making in a lever action repeating gun. The action is fully engraved with scroll and maple leaf and is in its original blued condition, as is the lever. The lever is a little bit more worn, looks like it's been refinished, but the action is original. If we move forward, the barrel is 28 and a half inch. Damascus black powder proof 70 mil chambered. That's a slight downside for me. It's the only downside to this gun is that I can't just buy ammo for shelf and chuck it in. However, imagine how special it would be loosing off a full magazine of, what's that, four plus one of big smoky boom cartridges. That'd be kind of cool. It has fitted sling swivels on the barrel and stock. And what I find really nice is you have a raised scallop rib all the way to the end which does make it feel a lot better than most other repeaters that just have a bead sight. This feels kind of precise and kind of cool. This feels like the sort of gun that you could use every day and you wouldn't feel disadvantaged. Where it gets really exciting from the gun, I mean, actually, hold on, you just need to look at this side of the action again. It's beautifully engraved, it really is, which is wild because most of the old repeating guns you get in here are just utilitarian. This was designed to be cool and beautiful. Where it gets really cool is how it was made, who it was made by, and when it was made. It was made or patented in England, America, and Germany in 1883. John Moses Browning gets patented, or at least given the accolade of the first successful repeating lever action shotgun, and this is three years older than that. And bluntly is way nicer. I'm guessing though he didn't, they didn't have sort of the Browning powerhouse and the Winchester powerhouse behind it to make it super successful. And looking at it, it was probably way more expensive and less attainable. And yet the design is really quite nice. Probably overcomplicated. I'm now talking myself out of this, but it was three years earlier and it, it was definitely nicer. The two guys that made this, Larsen and Winteros, one was from Sweden, one was from Norway. They had a Norwegian owned machine shop in Belgium. So this is a Belgian made gun by a Swede and a Norwegian. And it's very likely these actions were actually made by Mauser in Germany. Or at least there is evidence they bought 300 actions from Mauser in Germany. These guys never produced a bolt action rifle, but those actions, nobody knows exactly what they were. That is the only evidence we have. What's kind of cool about that is this is a truly international gun. That's kind of special. There's a load of digging you can do to try and find out more because not much is known about them. There are some known examples out there, but they're few and far between. And this is one of them. And it's seven to nine hundred pounds. 
What is semi-interesting as well is that none of them came with serial numbers, which kind of goes back into the fact that it's going to be hard to find out anything about them. Gunmakers with serials generally have records, records you can find where they were sold to, or who they were sold to, who they were sold by. This one has a serial number put on by the London Proof House when it was proofed so that it actually has an identification number. And doing a bit of research, one of the others that was actually available online a few years, quite a few years ago, didn't have a serial number either and was proofed in Belgium. This is a cool gun. I just, feels like you could have a lot of fun shooting. It feels like it would be quite shootable. In large part because of the way it balances, you've got a lot of weight between the hands and that it's eight pound four, which is, you know, a preferable weight for a shotgun in the modern era for a bigger human being. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love the way that this design works, how slick it is, how that camming system works. You just give it a push and then it will open itself and then the same kind of closes itself too. It's a sweetly designed gun. It's an innovative gun with a cool backstory for less than a thousand pounds. And you can go boom more than twice. I love it. Absolutely love it. I kind of feel they need, they need to own it, but I also am aware how rare this is that the seven to 900 price tag or suggested thing, probably it's gonna go for a lot more than that to a collector. If I did buy it, would I ever be bothered to find 16 ball black powder cartridges? You have to be honest with yourself, but I am going to sit here and get excited by it for another 15 minutes because, wow. Couple of nice B25s, a Maruku. This is interesting. Is this an Alex Martin? Which are made by Army Soleri in Italy. The engraving on them was always really interesting. The way they're fitted and feel in the hand are always really interesting. And they are a good quality gun. Slightly lesser known, the Alex Martins and the Soleris, but they are exceptional looks for the money. I don't know what lot 1611 is value wise. Look at how slender that forend is next to the barrel. Look how small the loop is. It is a lovely, lovely looking game gun. The lines of it are fantastic. This is a half finished project using an original boss end and barrels and making an entire new action for it. One presumes it was either spare barrels or found barrels. This is a pretty crazy project and it's half finished. There's some debate to be had, right? Does it make sense to buy a second hand boss over and under at Holtz for 25, 30 grand? Or to buy something like this, which would be a grand and have it finished. And it wouldn't be a boss, although it would be a boss. And have it made completely custom to you. A custom boss would be six figures, this, you're gonna be in for 20. Still a huge amount of money and you know, the second hand value of it would be very low. However, does that matter if you keep it forever? It's only gonna matter to your kids when they sell it. When you're dead, obviously. Lot 1456 is a James McNaughton Edinburgh model bar in wood shotgun. They are unlike anything else and they have a real particular following. I know this is the dream gun for a lot of people and they do come up relatively rarely, especially in good condition. This one is in at seven to 9,000 and it is in good condition, if not original condition. It's got new 28 inch nitro reproof barrels and a nicely figured 14 and a quarter inch replacement stock, done to a nice spec. I've never seen one of these with a replacement stock, or at least never spent time with one. You're kind of limited by the design of the gun as to how you, well you can do the stock, and by that I mean it has to be done well. You see a lot of replacement stocks that don't follow the original lines, and with this you're fairly well dictated that you have to because of the way it's put together. The thing with it 
as you'll see, is it's a little bit different. It doesn't have a traditional action bar, if you like. It doesn't have a square action. The wood actually comes up around that trigger plate action, creating an island in the wood. It's incredibly hard to stock and incredibly hard to build and regulate, and you have to admire it for its difference alone. But honestly, the way the wood and the metal flow together create a very special gun, and I can see why, again, I have one particular American friend who is obsessed by these, I can see why. I do prefer a larger lump of metal, personally, in the middle, but just the way these are crafted and the work it takes to make one is pretty wild. This particular one was built in 1906. It weighs six pounds, 14 ounces and comes in the original maker's case. I kind of like that it's got so many replacement parts. There's a strange onus when you buy something that is completely original condition to keep it as such. And you know, in those cases, you may have some weaknesses, a few cracks, or more importantly, you won't want to take it out and use it. This is a completely usable McNaughton skeleton action. It's sick. You have grape and vine leaf engraving throughout all the metalwork, of which there isn't a lot, but what there is there is beautifully covered and well done. This, it's a little stylized, and I kind of like that. It's not super detailed. It's almost cartoon-esque in its design, but I really like the way that it looks. You have a gold oval in the bottom that is not engraved, and that classic long top lever is engraved on sweet. You have a swing safety or a safety catch that switches side to side rather back and forth and that is automatic. That's going to be a personal preference for people whether you like that or not. It takes a little getting used to, right? We're so subjected to the standard push forward, push back safety catch that anything else takes a little learning, but it's not unintuitive to swing your thumb over the top there. All in all, and not a bad piece of kit. Again, the beauty of a restock is it's done in relatively modern measurements. Yes, it's 14 and a quarter inch, but I think the drops on it are something like one and a quarter and two and a quarter inches, which is very usable. Hey, they don't come up often, and when they do, they're usually of some kind of less than usable condition. This is a great option. And at seven to nine, I mean, you'd use that every day for the rest of your life and be quite happy, wouldn't you? Simon, I've just been looking at the skeleton action. Yes. I appreciate they have a huge following, and it's so very, very cool, but you are a big Scottish fanboy. Yeah, I, I am. I bore on ad nauseam um, about Scottish guns, but I happen to think that the quality, well, to sum it up, as I have done elsewhere, is I don't think you ever see a bad Scottish gun. You just see some that have had a much harder life than others. So underneath is usually a very, very well-made gun to a very, very high standard. And it's principally because there was a lot of money in Edinburgh and in Glasgow uh, in the Victorian era from the industrialists who were building ships and you know, creating new processes uh, in industry that were making them a, a fortune, literally fortunes. And they were spending that money on their leisure time on high quality guns, but they didn't want to shop down south because they're Scottish. They right. like buying Scottish produce, Scottish produced um, guns from the great Scottish gun makers. So there was a sort of in-house revolving door of money flowing into gun makers, gun makers then being able to come up with patents and develop uh, little idiosyncrasies that made them separate and distinct from the rest of the trade. There were crossovers. So for the first example I'm gonna put out here is a Dixon, but this is a London pattern side lock ejector. That's quite rare from Dixon. Yeah, they were usually special orders from gentlemen who said, I want to buy a Scottish gun, but I want it to look like a, an English gun. So there were exceptions to the rule. You can usually spot them by the elegance of this top lever. That is classic Dixon shape there, and the elegance of the safety catch. Again, double evenly spaced ramp. Very, very comfortable, very slick to use. Um, but on a classic London shape. They're beautiful things. They are beautiful things. Um, the, the Dixon that we all know and love is the round action. This, I'm gonna show it, turn it around in a minute. This is uh, a classic Dixon round action from the 1900s um, with really high quality Damascus barrels. It owes its design to a gun that we're gonna come on to talk to in a minute. And you mentioned the McNaughton um, skeleton action. 
Uh, this is a side lever Dixon round action, which is very, very unusual. Yeah, they didn't make very many of them. It's just a joy to know that this thing still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned up on evaluation day a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was the first gun out of a slip and I couldn't quite believe my eyes because everybody who listens to me bang on about these things knows I'm a big fan of Dixon's. They may not know that I'm a big fan of side levers as well. To put the both together, you get possibly my perfect game gun. You're gonna be selling all of your guns and assets to buy this? I'm not gonna get near this, I don't think. Yeah, very unlikely. No, yeah. um, I don't have that kind of asset. So, um, That's someone else's The table. estimate isn't huge, but it's already generating significant amount of interest, so you're going to have to play hard to get it. But mm -hmm. they do not come up that often, and when they do, there's usually a fight. So, the Round Action Dixon owes its development to this gentleman here, uh, James McNaughton, who apprenticed with Dixons before setting up on his own. So, so he, what did Dixon do before this? Box locks and side locks. So, well, I mean, this was in the era of um, muzzle loading percussion guns that were then developing into bre okay. breech loading brake action shotguns. So, this was on the cusp of the very fast pace of development in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. In the late 1870s, I think it was 79, uh, might have been a little bit earlier than that. McNaughton patented his trigger plate design. It was a lever cocking design. It's one of the exa few examples we don't have in this auction where it was, they're characterized by a very long, elegant top lever which pushes far across and that then cocks We've the seen hammers. Them here in the past. Yeah, and that was pre-Wesley or Anson and Dealey coming up with the barrel cocking idea to mm -hmm. then cock the hammers rather than it being on a lever. Then McNaughton refined his patent and his elegant trigger plate design which he may have borrowed from a German gun maker. There's no hard and fast evidence that he did actually borrow from Julius Koster in Germany, um, but he was friends with Koster's son and they must have been exchanging ideas and talking about what his dad was doing out of Germany. Um, and that was probably where the trigger plate design originated mm -hmm. as a germ of inspiration. So yeah, he, he developed it as a, a lever cocker first, then it was refined into a barrel cocker because it was just easier to use. And this is a barrel cocking trigger plate from McNaughton. Again, quite unusual, nice to see them. Yeah, We've why? got several examples in this auction. Why did trigger plates not become dominant, dominant until recently? Just Big fashion? <sighs> there, is, uh, there was probably a couple of reasons. They are, you have to understand the mechanics of them to build them properly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not to say that the gun makers down south weren't ever going to get there, it's just that they were all apprenticed on the classic side lock yeah. and classic box locks designs. So um, they carried on building what they were used to, what they'd done their seven years apprenticeship in. There was no need for them to do anything different because the market was strong for the products they had and they were producing and the designs they were um, perfecting. Things were different up north where you've got Scottish landowners, Scottish industrialists, plowing money into Scottish gun makers, supporting people with radically new ideas because they, there's a fair, an element of nationalism there. I mean, there was a, we want to buy Scottish. So um, make it better than the London boys, make it different. Make it different, yeah. stand out from the rest, do something slightly differently. And actually what they did is they came up with one of the fastest, best handling shotguns ever built and the, the trigger plate design was so successful that Dixon then bought McNaughton out oh, wow. and refined the patent and then that became the round action, trigger plate round action. And there's a reason now that many of the over and unders used in competition are trigger plate designs because of the way it shifts the center of gravity between the hands and lower down in the action. Again, I use the analogy I've used elsewhere. It's like fi finely tuning the chassis of a race car. That's how you get the handling is by shifting the center of gravity by design. So it's, it's a fascinating sort of uh, evolution of industry, evolution of economics, evolution of design that then comes up with these different elements of uh, gun design in Scottish guns. Moving on to the box locks, obviously these are all based on the original idea of Anson and Dealey to cock the, the hammers by the gravity of the barrels dropping down, that mm. then cams up the hammers. But you've got people like Joseph Harkham doing things differently. Yeah, look at 
those fences. Look at that. That is there. unmistakably Harkham mm -hmm. because nobody designs, nobody files an action that looks like that. Nobody else does that. And they're incredibly well made guns, these, mm -hmm. and they are idiosyncratic in their way. The safety catch is peculiar to Harkham. The shoulders are peculiar to Harkham. The, the balls and the detonators, however you want to call it, is peculiar to Harkham. That little filing of the forward end of the top lever to just oh, meet that yeah. perfectly, that's nice. Harkham. That's Harkham's attention to detail. So it's, and it's reflected. It's stylistically different. Completely. Stylistically yeah. different. It's reflected in the quality. This is a fairly, if you know a Birmingham box lock, you will understand the shape of this gun. This is Charles Ingram of Glasgow, but again, very high quality, very well done, intercepting sear, all of the latest design mm -hmm. work, but finished to a very high degree with beautiful engraving all round. Ingram doing what Ingram did, which is producing good stuff. You've got Mortimer in Edinburgh doing a similar thing. Um, Mortimer eventually bought Harkham out and then in the 30s, they were both bought out, well, you know, Mortimer owning Harkham name. In the 30s, Dixon bought them. So all of the names became consolidated under one banner. Dick Dixon is a monopoly of all. Yeah, they were, they were very successful makers. businessmen. Um, and barring one family tragedy when Peter Dixon, who was perhaps going to go back in to run the business with his brother, John the Younger, uh, drowned at sea on his way to Australia in mysterious circumstances. Apart from the family tragedy, they ran a business extremely well, mm -hmm. um, handed on from father to son, uh, and dominated and came to dominate the Scottish gun making business. You've also got further on down, Alex Henry, let's not forget the Henry rifle. This is um, That's quite an important uh, piece of history right there. Yeah, this is an obsolete calibre. So this is in day one of our sale. Henry was the preeminent rifle maker of his day and came up with this falling block design. Um, and w it was simple to use, very strong, very safe to use as well, and extremely popular and accurate. And he had numerous patents to his name, including the rifling of the Martini Henry. The Henry bit is Alexander Henry. Um, again, not immune to tragedy. Um, very, very sadly, when testing a rifle on one of his designs on a range, he managed to uh, shoot his own son as he was putting a target up. Um, and imagine going back to work after that. But he did, he went back uh, and continued to build high quality rifles. Yeah, accidentally. accidentally. Freak accident. Yeah. I think the, the, the kid was... just came out of the butt at the wrong time. Oh, wow. To change the target. Um, and caught a bullet, which is incredibly sad. Um, Luckily, we operate much safer ranges nowadays. One and we would have hope. Walkie -talkies. One would These hope. These things are helpful. Exactly. So yeah, uh, but you know, tragedy aside, again, more Scottish invention, more Scottish industrial brilliance of design being applied to gun making. Awesome, man. I presume this is your favourite gun in the sale. It's got to be up there, yeah. I mean, it's it is everything I want in a game gun. It's a Dixon round action with a side lever. I mean, you just, we don't see them very often. And when we do, and you and I were talking about the side lever, you were expecting it to be more sculptural. Yeah. It's not, it's functional. It's still good looking and it, it really does go, but my first thought would be, all be all rounded and serpentine, mm, but it's not. No, it's, it's designed to be easy to use. Yeah, and it is. And easy to use in absolutely hooking down Scottish weather on a grouse moor and still be able to find it and open it easily and swiftly and securely. But again, the whole Dixon round action design, it's not designed to be beautiful, that is just a happy accident. It was designed to be strong, fast handling and capable of shooting a brace of grouse out the front, turning around and taking a brace of grouse out the back. They were ultimately functional, but there are, there are little touches here that are very, very beautiful and some of the most beautiful guns ever made. Scottish guns hold their value? Yes. Um, so I know these guys do. The again, distance. it all depends on barrel condition. But yes, they, you're talking about some of the most desirable guns we, that are on the market come from Scotland. There's always a fight for them. So um, I can see this Harkin box lot being popular because we don't see a lot of them. That Ingram is a Birmingham Ingram, but still finished to a very high standard. And the Mortimer has this classic Mortimer double fluke I down do the side like of the front of the top lever. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's gorgeous. But when you see that, you think Mortimer straight away. I think they were just that much more personal because there was so few of them. I, get, I think it's partly Whereas um, in England, everything kind of blended into one. 
There's a house style for all gun makers, um, arguably. The Scots did it carving metal rather than engraving metal, it seems to me. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So they shaped things rather than embellished things. The high quality engraving outsourced to high quality engravers. But the actual filing of an action to get those shapes done in house. Awesome. Thank you, man. All right. There you are. Scottish cans. There's a reason I'm a fan. Lot 1630 is a Williams Sons that we have actually seen before. It did back in Holt's auction and I couldn't help but share it just for a couple of minutes. This is one of the most vividly engraved, loudest guns I've seen in here with us also being kind of classy. It is completely engraved in roses and thorns and bramble, it's cool. But it's the safety catch that does it for me. It's one of the most beautiful safety catches in the world and the more that I can share that with you, the better. It's now in for 15,000, which is a fair amount of money, but for a London built gun that's, well, just over 10 years old, that's not so bad. It's a 30 inch 20 ball weighing in at six pound nine. It's a great, gun like it's actually a beautiful thing and in terms of value for money that's that's solid it's nearly a hundred thousand pound gun new yeah i just love looking at it you rarely get guns that are this well balanced in terms of being obnoxiously beautiful whilst also being acceptable i guess is a strange word for it I love it. It's got to be worth a look, right? And that safety catch. I want that safety catch. I love that safety catch. I remember so well a couple of years ago walking in here and seeing my first thing like this. A Jacobs rifle? Yeah, a Jacobs double rifle. Obviously made famous because it was actually made for a British Army officer who finished up a colonel, uh, started off a, a captain, but he designed lots of different guns to his own designs, but with the idea of um, getting the army involved. And he was convinced that a rifle that fired explosive bullets, explosive bullets, explosive bullets, he didn't mess about this man, <laughs> would be the ultimate thing. In a, in, a, in a trained hands, he was convinced that this particular rifle would be able to destroy artillery positions, etc., etc., up to a thousand yards. I mean, was it, it, was that it has an that? extraordinarily oh, high wow. rear sight. 2,000 yards? Up to 2,000 yards. But, he experimented with all different sorts of things, and one of the things that he did was these, which this is the raw explosive bullet, has four wings on the side that engages with the four groove rifle. So you put it in and push it down. Absolutely. In the but but inside there went an explosive charge that Ely made up especially for him. But this was made out of a zinc alloy, so it was especially light for its size. So less and drop. It, less drop, and it flew a long, 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 long way. There are reports of him all around Jakakabad, where he had his base. He set up targets right out to 2,000 yards and would regularly shoot them with these guns that he had designed. He armed his blokes with these eventually he did this particular one is very special because by tradition this is the actual rifle that was made for colonel jacobs himself wow it's it's slightly different to all the other ones that are out there this one has bar action locks as opposed to back action locks the wording on the patch box is slightly different. And we believe that this is actually the prototype that Swinburne's, the gun maker, made up for Colonel Jacobs to say, this is what we're gonna do for you. Is this what you like? How many do you want? How many do you want? And what was the battle rifle at the time? The Patton 53, okay. which was a single shot 
So this is, a, mean, this it, is an upgrade. Well, it's an upgrade because it's got two shots yeah, for the price of one anyway. Good. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But the explosive bullet was a real thing. And um, it wasn't until after the Indian mutiny and whatever when what became known as dum-dum bullets, explosive bullets, became outlawed. And sadly, that early? The, uh, yeah, okay. sadly, then obviously the, uh, the 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 Jacob rifle concept of such didn't occur anymore. Although the rifles were still used with solids for a long time afterwards, but this being we believe the original came with its bayonet, came with two moulds. The sword bayonet is quite impressive as well. Well, it suddenly turns this from a pretty deadly weapon into a spear. No, absolutely. I mean, as I say, Colonel Jacobs, he did not mess about. He also came up with all different designs of swords for the army as well. He, what would cut better, what would cut deeper. What, I mean, the man was crazed, really. <laughs> Convinced with more efficient death. Yeah, absolutely. He was convinced that rifling was the way to go, which we yeah, now know yeah. it was, of course. But as I say, he tried all these different concepts and you know zinc alloy bullets was well ahead of its time well ahead of its time um, that is amazing and uh, yeah yeah quite impressive and how many were made in total after this well as I say we believe that there was only one only that was ever made exactly like that but the the rifles themselves they made about 1500 okay. although they do survive in quite large numbers they obviously had a when they were sold out of service, they had quite a use to hunters and things yeah. like that, double rifles. So a lot of them survived, even though obviously condition is often against the surviving examples. Mm -hmm. This particular one uh, is lovely. And to retain its case, again, it's one of only three cased or three known cased examples. Um, and you had one of the other ones already. We have had one of the <laughs> other ones already. But this one is so lovely because it, it's got the caps, it's, it's got the actual bullets, it's got the detonators for the bullets. Um, it's even got a treatise on the rifle itself. Written by, by him. By, written by him, but it's got all the accessories and everything. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful set. We've got his pistol as well. Yeah, well, that absolutely. is the Lord of War. <laughs> I mean, a big rifle like that's no good without a backup, is it? Well, right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Inventing explosive bullets, armor-piercing bullets. Yeah, absolutely. New swords, bigger guns. Yeah. yeah. I mean, basically American. Yeah, exactly. I mean, ranges and things like that were just in the imagination with, with Colonel Jacobs. He was convinced that anything could be made to shoot much, much further, much more accurately and much quicker as well. We had fairly accurate artillery pieces back then already, so he's understanding that guns have range. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, his idea of the explosive bullet was, as, yeah, was right. really aimed for taking out artillery positions. It wasn't designed for shooting soldier to soldier. It was designed for shooting at gun positions. And these and explosives like were enough to take out a gun? Well, that we will never know, sadly, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I would imagine that he did his yeah. research. For 20 grand <laughs> we can find out. <laughs> but again, very, very, very few of these are known. Um, I was speaking to the Royal Armouries, they know of two others, um, so this is like the third one that's come to light. Whether these were ever issued to Jacob's officers or not is not known. I mean, the, the quality of this is particularly high. The engraving and the build quality in general is probably above a military pistol. So it may literally be a sidearm that was made to Jacob's principal. Yeah, and his boys, if they wanted one, could have. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like but the sort of thing you'd come up with again, the dinner table, it, doesn't it? Yeah, this, this one's only sighted to 400 metres. So, he did, <laughs> so he, he did sort of set his sights a little lower than the rifle. I love this guy. This guy. Yeah, I, yeah he's, he's quite a personal hero of mine as well. He, he definitely came up with some good ideas. <laughs> Anything that was progressing guns yeah I mean I appreciate that their, their uses fact, were he perhaps spent his own money developing them he didn't get grants from the army or the government or anything like that he spent his own money developing all this sort was of it thing. speculative do you think like, yeah. do you think he was hoping that the army would take it on and he'd well, get I some think, kind yeah. of big bonus yeah yeah, but in the end, it was only his private units that ever got them. They were ne never sort of widely issued. 
I would imagine probably the army would have rejected it on the build costs. Of course, yeah. That's why I mean, it takes a lot of rifles. skill. It takes a lot of skill to put a double rifle together and culminate the barrels and everything. And you know that that for one extra shot probably didn't seem enough for the army to take you it say on. Say that that is double capacity. Yeah, it? like that. That's quite a lot. Yeah, I'd rather have that than a. Absolutely. Well, I mean, in those days, double firepower is double firepower. Oh, yeah. not <laughs> no, there's no drum mags. No. This is the drum mag. This guy invented well, the drum yeah, mag. Yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, the first assault rifle. <laughs> Definitely. But no, I love this as well. And that's, that's an amazing piece of history. Lot 1517 caught my eye straight away. It's a 16 bore side by side by Joe Manton. What's interesting about it is that the action shape looks real old and real early. And that's because this gun is from 1822, or at least that's when it started life. Those among you who are into your older guns or have been watching these Holtz videos for a while will appreciate that that is pre-breech loaders. That is because this started life very likely as a Joseph Manton tube lock muzzle loader. And was converted to a very high quality at an unknown later date. This blows my mind, right? If you've seen a tube lock and you've seen this, the amount of work it would have taken to retrofit this into a breech loader is wild. Would have taken, I don't know, ingenuity is the wrong word, some madness. But I guess it was, was at a time where labor was relatively inexpensive and as such for somebody to do that. It was also a time of great gun innovation. So there were a lot of really wildly talented people out there to whom that challenge would have been quite exciting. But, just, yeah, it's quite possibly, ergo, the earliest ever breech-loading shotgun. Whereas it's up there, for sure, at 1822 birthday. We're going to start at the front with 28 and a half inch bold twist Damascus barrels. It's lovely seeing all this stupidly beautiful Damascus, but this is, firstly, it's high quality because it was London Nitro proofed in 2014, so this is good to go with modern two and a half inch 16 bore shells. I love the look of this. It's just slightly different. The thing is with the bolt twist barrels is usually you see it associated with slightly lower quality guns. This is not one of them, which is kind of exciting. This is probably the original stock from the muzzle loader in 1822. And as such, you have a metal butt plate with an elongated top spur, as was the style back then. You can't hate that. Tight flat point checkering and some plain old wood. Again, this is what guns looked like back then. Kind of pale. And you look at a lot of muzzle loaders, they will have this style of wood. I don't hate it. I really don't hate it. Darker wood became fashionable later on and these things change. And if you put this on a gun nowadays, I'd feel, I'd, I'd feel cheated. But it suits the gun down to the ground. The lock plates are engraved Joseph Manton with some light acanthus scroll work and you have a raised concaved rib with Joseph Manton Hanover Square London on it. It's non-rebounding locks so you have to cock those back to open the gun. Bring them to half cock. Push the side, the big rotary lever to the side and the gun opens up. This is some beautiful gun making. It really is. For seven to nine hundred pounds. I guess some of that is to do with the lack of desirability given that it is six pound 19. It's a heavy conversion. It's not as svelte as some of the later 16 balls you'll find. But for most of us out there, that weight isn't going to be a problem for what we use guns for in the modern era. I love it. I think that's a really nice thing. And given that it probably won't be your daily driver, if you're gonna have a side-by-side -side in the cabinet, why not have one with a blooming cool story?
Nick Nick Holt of Holt's Auctioneers. You have been going on about these guns all day. I hope they are just as special as you make out. I have not been going on and on about these pistols. A little bit. But, maybe a little bit. But they are full of history, full of story, full of skullduggery. They've just got so much going for them. It's a and pair of Lancaster I, howders. The correct, correct. These are in just cracking condition and were made for a scallywag. A boy of 18 who um, came from uh, Southern Ireland, um, 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 that he became the, the Marquis of Waterford. He was permanently drunk, permanently being a naughty boy. Some boy. With, with what? He was some boy. He was some boy. And he had a, um, uh, a reputation of, of wherever he went was just chaotic. And, and he had the money to do it. An idol of yours, by any chance? <laughs> I don't know about that, but, 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 but get, getting on the rate, yes. Yeah. I mean, they were built in 1840. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, if you get a chance, just Google the Marquess of Waterford. So I and read your very nice catalogue, and apparently, tenuously, mm. painting the town red comes from this guy. Yes, it does. There's four or five stories in there about how he was drunk with his friends and people tried to stop him and there was skullduggery. Apparently some gatekeeper or something stops him. There's a load of red paint around. So they lock him in his house and paint his house red. Go down the pub, paint the sign red. I mean, it sounds like they had a jolly good time. <laughs> I mean, he died. He died at 48. Um, um, and he, you know, he had a, uh, the life he had was astronomic. Um, uh, obviously he loved, loved going away and shooting and hunting. They are a st stunning pair. And the wonderful thing about these things is, of course, they are antique, no license required. That's pretty smart. Yeah, so, so, so you can put a little bit of money in there and they're an investment. I like that. They are an investment. And, they, um, and so if we look at these things, which were made 60, 160, 180, 180, 190 years ago, to be still in this condition in their case. The case is lovely. Um, uh, Holy Moses. I mean, most of our, my, my parents and my grandparents, you know, that it was all, and, and great, great grandparents, all cleaned away and, and that's that. How the earth has somebody managed to keep these like this? Keep them clean for that keep, long. Yeah. I Estimate on them, uh, five to seven thousand, worth every bloody penny. This in itself is a rare thing. This is a William Powell and Sons 28 gauge side lock ejector. 28 gauge side lock ejectors are rare, unequivocally. Pairs even more so, and we have the other gun in the case here. Although looking at the catalog, pair is in inverted commas because this is actually two guns out of a trio. They were made a year apart and 1500 serial numbers, but they were made to match. One presumed the original pair was made at the same time and a third gun was ordered because, well, clearly someone was feeling pretty cool in 1908 when they wanted a third gun for their tr to make a trio of 28 gauge side lock ejectors. The guns have 14 and a quarter inch nice wooden stocks with Prince of Wales grips. The checkering is beautiful and tight, probably sort of 28 to 30 lines per inch, which suits that beautiful scaled action. What's interesting ish is that the number three gun actually has 70 mil or two and three quarter inch chambers and was nitro reproved in 2023 presumably ergo that was bought out after market or maybe it was proofed wrong at the start more than likely being taken out later down the line rather than in 1908 somebody saying i want a third gun with a different chamber size both guns have 28 inch fine damascus barrels with the finish well worn i mean these are original guns and as such show marks of the fact that they're 120 years old or best part thereof the engraving is nice you have segments of scroll bouquets of flowers with the william powell on there and the 35 Car Street, Birmingham, written on the top. 
The exciting part about this is both are choked in quarter choke, both are shootable, and they're three to five thousand pound for a, the pair, which is pretty reasonable. I love the way that this gun is scaled down, or these guns are scaled down, but the fineness of the finial on the forend, it's usually kind of fun to get excited to buy the little stuff, but how small that is, even at the tip, is wild. I would have thought these will go out to America, mostly because these are, oh, can you imagine shooting quail with these? That would be amazing. At this point, we should say, for those who don't know, Holtz sell all over the world, same as they get guns from all over the world, and they will help people sort of get guns there. I'd love these to stay in England, but I do feel like their rightful home is, it could be in America. How fun would that be? Beautiful little guns. Absolutely beautiful little guns. I suppose you could dedicate your life trying to find the number one. Or maybe if you're mad enough, you buy them and have a number one made to match. That would be pretty wild. Automatic safeties, double triggers, long-ish trigger tangs for a Prince of Wales with unengraved ovals on the bottom. When you see older William Powell's, it's one of those makers that's easy to glance across. It's just, it's good quality gun making, but they don't have the flash and the pizzazz of some others, although you do see some wildly high grade ones. Any pair of side-by-side -side 28s is cool. This one is hyper cool. This is lot 1367, or these are lot 1367. They were once owned by Paddy Hopko, or they were former property of Paddy Hopko. They weren't made for him, however, he was born in 1933, but these were born in 1902 and 1905, respectively. Then somebody bought a single gun and then ordered another one to match it as a pair. So they are a true pair of guns, they're numbered one and two, and it was all done, obviously, by Holland and Holland. The pattern on here isn't the Howland House scroll, it's similar, inspired by, but not quite the same, and I love how it's similar, and to a quick glance, you just go, it's a Holland, but it's different enough that makes it special. They were both restocked in 1915 by the maker for an owner at the time. Paddy Hopkirk was the greatest, or one of the greatest British rally drivers ever, I suppose. He won the 1964 Monaco Winter Rally, starting in Minsk, beating a load of other bigger, better teams in a Mini. You know, this is 64, in the 60s, the Mini has become this huge cultural icon. He becomes not famous overnight, but pretty much famous overnight. A household name. I think the stories in this book, certainly I've read today and learned more about the man. Definitely a cool dude. Cool pair of guns, cool previous owner you could be the next one. Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you wanna support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content, well, some extra content, and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day. I was mesmerized.